Hey guys, Dave from Nardarchy for Nerds by Nerds, and today I have with me Mike Myler, and uh, Miss Vakuma is uh, how you were brought to my attention. Uh, one of the, one of the players in one of my games that I've gamed with previously, Vex, is like was raving about your your campaign setting and the, and the work you've done. Um, before we jump into that, just a little uh, housekeeping, guys. I want to apologize about yesterday. Uh, as you know, some of you may or may not know, I ended up you know taking my wife to the emergency room earlier in the week, and she's in the hospital. So, yes, the the day before, I usually confirm my guests, and I completely forgot, and my guest was from New Zealand. So by the time I remembered, there was like no chance, and yeah, you know, so there was some miscommunication there, guys. I just wanted to apologize real quick. Also, um, from heroics to heroes is, or from hit dice to heroics is out. It's over on the website. Uh, with that, let's uh, let's dive into Mr. Vakuma. And, I, and how badly am I butchering that? No, no, that's about right. That's about right. So, um, Mr. Vakuma, uh, well, hi, everybody. My name is Mike Myler. I'm a freelance full-time RPG designer in the past half decade or so. Uh, I, I've got to work with a lot of awesome people like Paizo and Fantasy Flight. Um, I do a lot of work with EN World. Uh, I'm a columnist over there, and I'm also the editor of the EN Cider Patreon. But... Mr. Vakuma is an awesome Eastern fantasy noir steampunk campaign setting in that order. Uh, so the, the premise, right, is that about 150, 160 years ago, these foreigners appeared uh, over this huge energy wall called the Great Divide, the edge of the world. And they're flying these lightning powered ships. They just completely overpowered all the natives of Sobrin. And all of these people who were uh, just finishing like two millennia of warring with one another get drafted into this distant conflict called the War of Cayo, and they're occupied for about 150 years. About 60 years in the timeline back, uh, all communication stops from across the Great Divide. No one's sure what happened. Anybody who goes and investigates doesn't come back. So they managed to hold on to this foreign occupation for about five more decades before the locals overthrow them. Emperor Hitoshi Masudo, Hitoshi Masudo is uh, you know, reinstated, and they have a brief period of peace, and then the Miss of Akuma show up. The Mists of Akuma are these supernatural fog that corrupts people and strips them of their dignity. And when you're, like, finally, they've taken away the last of your humanity, you're transformed into this Adetto Oni, which is basically a, a fast zombie that's just barely smarter than an animal. And that's what's ruining uh, the world and, and killing everyone. The other side of that is the Mists of Akuma, uh, when it hits an object, it can cause it to age faster than normal. And so we took this thing out of Japanese folklore called Tsukumugami, uh, which is after uh, about a century, an item might, you know, sprout arms and legs and a mouth and, and a personality uh, that fits how well it was treated while well inanimate. And the problem with that is that there's a bunch of war machines left over from the War of Kayo. So everyone's terrified of technology because, like, yeah, that's a really handy gun, but, like, what if the Misakuma make it into a monster and it, you know, bites you and shoots you in the face? <sighs> maybe the not in that order. Yeah, maybe not in that order, but uh, <laughs> yeah. it, it causes a heretical fear of technology. Which is not to say that all of the prefectures hate or fear technology, but uh, 21 of them do. So we've got Noir, we got uh, Asian Fantasy, and we also have uh, Steampunk. How, how did you go about doing Asian Fantasy? Because there's like, so like, it, it's a little bit of a tricky area, you know, to be respectful to the source and, you know, and still create interesting fun. Did you worry about that at all, or did you, you did. just dive right in? Although I should mention that we have a Kickstarter going right now called Imperial Matchmaker that you can look up and download nine free PDFs right now, eight of which were illustrated by Claudia Pogues. So when we went about it, um, <clears throat> we did a Kickstarter for this back in 2016, and we were originally going to name one of the cities Chikan. Uh, I did not realize this, but Chikan, in addition to the meaning of the word that I thought it was, also means a uh, creepy old man that grabs girls on the subway. Yeah, right? Like, I can't <laughs> even believe there's a word for that, but there is. Mm. So um, we took the full manuscript once we were done, and we sent it to an uh, English-speaking professor that lives in Japan, and we had him and his students read over it. Uh, they're st apparently still playing a game set in Mississippi, which drives me nuts because I want to know everything about it. Uh, but they looked it over. They told us, like, okay... This and this might not be right. This might not be good. So we, we did have some uh, some actual Asian people look over all of our stuff to confirm that we were not offensive or uh, you know otherwise undermining their culture. Well, and that you know that's really cool to to do that because I know right now you can go on certain places and buy an Oriental's handbook for for D and D. 
you, you know what? You can kind of get away with it in AD&D when you can claim ignorance to a certain extent or, le- you know, you know, less awareness, but in this day and age, it's just not going to fly. Yeah, yeah. That's but, probably why we're never going to see another Fighting Man too, right? <laughs> it could be a very good uh, possibility. Fighting folk or people, maybe? Maybe. <laughs> fighting person? I, I would accept a fighting person class for April Fool. So, uh, so why Mrs. Akuma? What inspired you to do this? Because, like I said, this is a very specific setting. Okay, well... This was my third campaign setting. I got five total. Uh, we did the first one. It was just like our homebrew world, like the one that I started playing Pathfinder with because that's what drew me back into RPGs after college. And then we did one uh, called Hypercore 29, which is superhero cyberpunk because Pathfinder took a really interesting way to do epic levels. They created this thing called Mythic Adventures, which is a rules template that you just lay over the existing Pathfinder rules. So you could have a first level epic character, right? And I thought, oh, this is great. And then I played through some of it, and I was like, conceptually, this is great. In practice, this kind of sucks. So we made our own system called Hyperscore, which is more like superheroes as opposed to demigods. And then I was like sitting here one night working on the, the final bits of it, and I was like, oh, what would have happened if in like 1854, when Matthew Commodore C. Perry like sailed into Edo Harbor and pointed his steel gunboat uh, arms at like the city? Like, what if there was magic there when he got there? You know, what if the Japanese could have actually mounted a resistance? And that's where it started. And then, like, obviously it got out of the real world and started to get into the fantasy stuff. I was like, okay, well, then, you know, why would they... Why wouldn't the Ceramians still be there? Okay, well, then there needs to be some sort of conflict that takes them out of it and so on and so forth. And then just kind of steamrolled from there. I have a design team that I work with. And um, when I presented it to them, they were all like, oh, what? It changes people into demons? Okay, we're in. And uh, once they got a hold of it, and you know, the setting was born. So, so how much of a steampunk element is there if, like, there's this kind of fear of technology? I'm glad you asked that. That's why steampunk is always the last descriptor. It's Eastern <laughs> fantasy, noir, and then steampunk. Uh, in one of the free primers or the PDFs for the current Kickstarter, uh, the Soberin primer, on the like second page or so, there's like a little sidebar that tells you exactly what to take out of the book if you want a more traditional. Eastern, like, medieval setting as opposed to all the steampunk bits. Like, all the scientific prefectures are on the corners of the map, so you can just, like, imagine that they're they're not there and it's not a problem. And, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, we tried to, we tried to modulate the design of the setting so that if you didn't want to do steampunk, you could just take it out, because we know a lot of people are not into steampunk, which is totally fine and cool. Uh, I didn't want to leave them out in the lurch. I, I recently have gotten uh, into more uh, more steampunk. I, and actually, I got into it kind of because I was just like, I can't read another fantasy book right now. I just need to read something else. And uh, Mark Hoder did a series, um, Sir Richard Burton and Swinehill, which is kind of like alternate Earth, steampunk-ish. You know, and uh, that, that was like kind of like my gateway drug. I wasn't really sold on steampunk. Like, I liked Steam Boy a lot. Uh, but I like everything that Miyazaki touches, so whatever. Um, what sold me was I, I read through uh, China Mieville San Perdido Station, uh, which if you've never read it, uh, don't be put off by the first chapter. The whole sec- the whole book is not like man bug sex. That's just like a weird thing that he does at the beginning to set the stage. It doesn't... Did you say man that. bug? The book is not that. It just happens in the first chapter. You're going to be like, what the fuck? Keep reading. <laughs> It won't repeat. Like it's oh worth going through. But uh, yeah, it's a really crazy book. It, he he took this very original take on steampunk. Like it wasn't like everything's powered by steam or whatever. It's about this guy creating an engine that like used crisis energy, and it it all had this really excellent feel and approach, sort of like the mysticism you get out of Warhammer 40k. And that I was like, okay, well, I guess you can do steampunk and not be like totally lame about it. So, uh, Miss of Akuma, is that for Pathfinder and 5e? Or... Only 5e. Only uh, 5e. Pathfinder, actually, I love Pathfinder, and I, w- I love supporting Paizo, but they have uh, certain restrictions on the compatibility license, and there is no compatibility license for 5e, um, where you can't endanger kids. And that was another one of the reasons we did Miss of Akuma, because when we did Hypercore, uh, there was one guy who you know participated in the Kickstarter and paid extra money to include his character in the book, and is named Eshu of Ninja. It was real, it's a dude from Africa who wanted to include a character that was like a child soldier in Africa that used his superpowers to end child soldiering in Africa. 
And I was like, awesome, great. Paizo can't possibly, Paizo's like, no, you can't do that. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, he, he can't be shot at. And I was like, what do you, you guys have an iconic that's a nine year old. And whatever, they wouldn't let me do it. Mm -hmm. So in the Pathfinder version, he's got a fucking goatee and like a little mustache. And then in the 5e version, he's just himself. In the so Pathfinder I, version, we just made him a halfling. <laughs> That was basically, yeah, yeah, we were just like, we just made, put facial hair on him. He's an adult. Oh, um, my God. So with Mr. Vakuma, I was like, well, I want to have, like, I, I don't want to be any leashes. So, like, there's parts in the book where, like, a, a whole school children, like, a whole school of children get changed into a dead Oni, right? And I, I wouldn't be allowed to have that in the Pathfinder version. So there is no Pathfinder version. If you want something like that for Pathfinder, there's a great horror Eastern setting called Candon from Wright Publishing. And I always point people to that. Oh, cool. Uh, so Anthony Amato from Cardboard Fortress, you're you're incognito today, buddy, using your real name. Uh, was uh, Cabanera and the Iron Fortress an inspiration? Cabanera? I'm not familiar with Cabanera. Uh, Iron Fortress sounds familiar though. Yeah, I could also be mispronouncing it. This huge possibility. Oh, Cabaneri of the Iron. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, no, but I'll watch this, dude. Uh, what I would say the inspirations are, it's more like, uh, hold on, I have it listed on the Kickstarter page. Uh, Edo Era Japan plus Ravenloft plus Warhammer 40,000 or Afro Samurai plus Onimusha plus Sin City. That's a mouthful. That. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so hard to explain it in like one thing, but if I can just say, look, Afro Samurai, Onimusha and Sin City at once, you know, like that, that gives a good picture. Cool. So, so do you have ongoing campaigns going right now? Uh, like adventuring campaigns? Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, my favorite is the On Turbine Wings crew, because for whatever reason, they're all obsessed with getting across the Great Divide. Uh, I know exactly what happens to them. I have a whole 200-page book for what happens when you, when you get across the Great Divide, but uh, they're the first group that has really set their sights on it. We'll see. I hope they, get, I hope they make it. I'm, I'm with them. I want them to make it there. But uh, it's a hard trip. Yeah. How many games do you got going right now? Uh, I don't know. Maybe a half dozen. It's, yeah, at least a half dozen. Oh, that's I a lot. Play test everything. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not quite the same as normal. The On Turbine Wings crew is the closest one to a normal game. And I normally run games like I'm, um, I'm just like a PS3 and they're playing Grand Theft Auto. And I'm just, I'm just there to facilitate whatever it is they do. Thus, why they are trying to leave the continent that I have made this large book around. <laughs> well, so yeah, that that makes sense. You know, you have to, to get the play testing in. So, mm -hmm. so do you have a process for that? Uh, well, let me see. First, I start with an outline, and then I'll normally get a game going when I'm about halfway through writing the outline because I'll have like the start of whatever it is I need to play test. I'm ready to go, and I can start figuring out, like, oh, you know, this is too powerful, this is too weak, that kind of stuff. How um, many uh, play testers do you have to draw from? I'll probably pull about two dozen. All right, that's not bad. No, it's not bad. And, and I do a lot of weird, different stuff. Like, some of them were, like, I have this, this giant book about playing evil characters, and half of my play testers were just like, no. <laughs> no, we know what you do, Mike. We're not playing evil characters. And I was like, all right, fine. Fine, it's cool. Let's do whatever. We else. know what happens once you shave the facial hair off the halflings. We're out. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what else is cool right now? There's one for Starfinder where they're trying to escape a uh, a super prison. Mm. That was actually that 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 that's. I was really worried about that one because like that's one of those ones where because normally I'm a sandbox and you just go wherever, but like here it's like you're you're stuck in this box. So I had to make sure that I wrote all the rules for being stuck in the box without. You know, taking away the fun part, because like it's not fun to be in prison, but like it's prison adventure. <laughs> Come on, how can you say that? <laughs> Have you actually been in prison? How do you know it's not fun in prison? <laughs> uh, I've never been in prison, but I've been locked up, and I can tell you, it's it's not it's not all it's cracked up to be. Uh, that's just, there you go, kids. Stay out of prison. Stay out of prison. We can we can quote Mike on that one. Uh, Jinker GM, what era or time period do you usually use? Ooh, uh, I don't usually use anyone. I, 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 the Varanthia Codex is largely medieval uh, with like one continent that has reached diesel punk level technology. That would be the continent led by Goblinvania. Uh, then Hypercore is in the future. 
uh, 29 and Wasteland is in the future. Miss of Akuma is in the distant past. And then Book of Exalted Darkness is is roughly analogous to like the 1920s. So I, it's, it's, it's too wide of a range for me to pick one. Um, I like medieval fantasy, but like so many people do it. Like, why would I bother putting out books for it? You know? Well, you know, it's not, and sometimes you just need something different. And as always, guys, in the description, you can find plenty of links over on Facebook as well as uh, as YouTube. If you're ever on Twitch, you're beat. You're gonna have to go. You're gonna have to go stalk the links elsewhere. But we do have them, so we want them to check. We want you guys to check them out. We've got social over, social links over there. Website, uh, also Drive Through RPG, and you have a bunch of free stuff on Drive Through RPG. If people wanted to check out. I'm a really big believer in free, and I fund all my stuff through campaigns and or Kickstarters. This is the seventh Kickstarter, and whenever I do a Kickstarter, I you know I want people to know what they're going to get. So, yeah, I got there's probably about thirty three free free things now, right? I don't know. I just saw I saw a long list of free. I mean, there's some paid stuff, but there's also free stuff. So you guys can you guys can take it for a test drive before you buy. Yeah, big 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 believer in free because I'm a cheap guy. <laughs> even before i was a writer i didn't have a lot of money so how i spent it is always extremely important and uh well yeah. i've spent a lot of time not having a lot of money but i've never really been cheap it's, it's actually one of my flaws and one of, my, one of the problems so elf bait wants to know any hints for getting games set in anime settings to actually feel like anime and not just another rpg with anime window dressing so one of the things we have in Mr. Fukuma is this thing called Haitoku. There are two new attributes. One is dignity, which is how, how, you know, how honorable people think that you are. So you can be like a bastard. As long as you're good at making it look like you're good, you can have a high dignity. And then Haitoku, which is the, the, the mechanical factor for Mr. Fukuma. Uh, there's no word in English for Haitoku. The closest we have is a fall from virtue. So you can, might think of it as like the dark side. Um, when you go down... You can make a Haitoku save to pop yourself back up, uh, which is, I always felt, very anime. And then uh, all the archetypes, uh, I wish I had time to quick snap the samurai one. If you, gra- if you grab the sober and primer, the samurai paladin archetype is in there. And there's this ability that took us, no doubt, at least four hours of design work. Just this one ability to get it to work out right. But you know in animes, you see the samurai run past a dude, and then suddenly his, like, his fucking midsection falls out? I have that ability for samurai. It's it took forever to write the right way, but like you can totally dash disembowel somebody. That's uh that's it's there's a term for that, right? Ah, uh, there's got to be. There's a term for when they are you talking about yeah, did you, the thing where they draw, strike, and sheath their blade in the same smooth movement. Maybe movement? I don't think so though. I'm, I'm pretty sure that, for that. That's in there, but like, that that running that running slash thing happens so much. There's got to be a term for it. I, I think we just called it dashing strike. If if there's one word to describe <laughs> a, a perverted old guy, <laughs> <laughs> you think, right? Yeah, yeah. The little dude grabbing. Yeah, yeah. That was a weird one. Yeah. Then there's got to be a word for that as well. Uh, so James Leslie, when you're making a campaign setting, do you have a particular formula to start with? Do you start with lore, then build towns and NPCs, or uh, for there, or is it all kind of random? I actually just left a comment for somebody on Facebook about this. So, um, is this the right one? No, it's not it. Fuck. Okay, so you start with the North Star word, right? So you need to determine what, if you had to boil all of your campaign setting down into one single word, what would that word be? Uh, for Varanthia, the word was radical. And so if you look at anything Varanthia Codex and you take it out and you just look at it by itself, you're like, oh, dude, rad. Like, that is the correct response. And so everything in the setting feels together. Uh, Hypercore, very obviously hyper. 29 Wasteland, it was Desperation. Uh, Book of Exalted Darkness, we actually use two because they're two major themes. So it's either heresy or holy. And then for Miss of Akuma, the, the theme word was cool. So if you look at anything in the book, you should be like, cool. You know? <laughs> uh, after you have your North word, your, your North Star word, because again, I cannot, I cannot emphasize how important that is, um, you should figure out a naming convention because uh, if you're just doing stuff like or, you know, with your friends at a table and you only have to name a dozen villages, use nonsense words. No one's going to notice. When you're filling a whole map with like 300 nonsense words, we're all going to know as soon as we look at the map. So figure out your naming convention and then stick to it throughout. Uh, there's so many things to remember. Oh my uh, God, you just described my, my whole my whole uh, convention. <laughs> nonsense words. This sounds cool. Here it goes. Yeah, yeah. 
it, 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 like I said, in a small context, that works totally fine. But like when you're looking at hundreds and hundreds of nonsense words, like it's obvious it's nonsense because we have linguistically coded brains. Um, mm. Yeah, the timeline's really important, but don't put too much emphasis on it. The importance of the timeline is only that it fits and like doesn't lie to itself. So as long as everything that else in the book fits to your timeline, do that last. Uh, the map is only Im as important as you make it. Figure out your national powers early, and that will tell you how important that map is. And in addition to your theme, figure out what kind of story you want the setting predicated to tell, right? Like, knowing that you want to do high fantasy is great, but, like, is should the party be trying to explore? Should they be trying to win glory? Are they, like, out to undo tyrants? There needs to be some predication in the book with an expectation of the type of story you're going to tell with it. And once you figure that out, then you should be good. So, do you get to actually play at all, or you always just play test? <laughs> uh, I have a Sunday morning group, and we switch off sometimes I get to play. Uh, nice. Right now, we, we were doing Storm King's Thunder, uh, which drives me insane for so many reasons. Um, and then we, right now, we're in uh, a homebrew world called Jade doing uh, East City Watch Adventure or something. I'm actually playing a character out of type because when I do get to play, I'm, I'm a bastard. I'm always that guy who's like, I'm chaotic neutral with a charisma of 18. And uh, this time, I said no, because you guys always kill my characters. I'm going to play a lawful good paladin, but I hate lawful good characters, so I picked uh, one of my favorite characters from media, which would be Sergeant Murtaugh from Lethal Weapon. And so I'm just playing Sergeant Murtaugh in a medieval <laughs> town, and it's great. It's great. They're all like, we... Uh, three we more days! I just got to make it three more days! <laughs> That's it, yeah. He's like, he doesn't want to, anything but to make it to retirement and collect his pension. Hmm. Even though his pension is worth so much less than all the gold that we've gotten, he just wants that pension so bad. That that's the golden prize. That's the trophy. I love yep. it. They're like we could get a flying ship and all this. He's like, no, that sounds terrible. Let's destroy the flying ship I, so I can retire. I and just want a regular ship and a little one, and I want to be able to go sail, go out on my boat and fish, and that's it. Oh God, I hadn't <laughs> even thought about the fishing boat. Holy shit! <laughs> I'm making a note right now. I forgot about the fishing boat. Epiphany. Bam. Good on you, dude. Dude, when you go back, when you go back to town, like you have to have the boat and bring the party to it, and have them drink uh, drink ales, you know, just sitting on the dry dock boat. <laughs> and then some of the some of the still active guard can come by and we'll be like, "Fuck you!" Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you need to do it in the game before before he retires, and not say anything to anybody, and just see if they pick up on it. Oh, maybe, maybe. <laughs> yeah, oh my god, does he have a daughter? Does he have kids? He has like five kids, yeah. Yeah, nice. Yeah. And they're always causing trouble and stuff. No, he's been really good. So if, you, if you're ever like having trouble playing against a certain alignment type, pick a character you really dig and just play that character. Nobody has complained to me that I'm playing Murtaugh from Lethal Weapon. Not a single human being has been like, why didn't you make your own? I don't know. They're all like, Murtaugh is awesome. So, yeah. And yeah. I love playing Murtaugh too. We're, we are big proponents and fans for modeling. Like and yeah, obviously you kind of have to make the character your own as well. That's true. Yeah. But uh, but modeling is is a great way to go, and that, that also is a great character to pick as well. Especially, I forget what number at this point. There's so many of them when when they, when Jet Li's in it, and they're like they want to just walk away because they're like they just know they're gonna get their ass handed to them, <laughs> and they're like we don't want to die, and then they're just like trying to justify why they have to go back and try and take them down. The gun thing. We got to figure out how he did the gun thing. <laughs> and I'm surprised. Like uh, the TV series, I thought was going to be terrible, but it's it's actually pretty good. If the, you haven't uh, watched it yet, Lethal Weapon TV series is surprisingly good for something with Damon Wayans in it. <laughs> I have not. I have not checked it out. Yeah, they got. It's like they're younger. They're not the you know, and and it's sort of out of the continuity of the movies. But no, it's it's yeah. Like I watch it every week. And I'm pretty satisfied with it. Uh, cardboard fortress i played uh, i played a gladiator as jim from taxi once people loved it <laughs> <laughs> good way to do we yeah i don't know there's so there's something about like the 80s and 90s movies and tv shows we just don't we just don't get those anymore i think it's the lack of cocaine in the writing room 
Oh, is that what it is? <laughs> I think it might have something to do with it, yeah. Like, if you look at 80s movies, you can definitely tell where, like, oh, man, there was a lot of cocaine in that movie. Like, uh, we watched, uh, what the fuck was it called? Running Crazy had Billy Crystal in it the other day, me and my wife. And, like, the whole thing was just so everywhere. Like, like the plot was everywhere. The characterization was everywhere. The dialogue was spotty. And then, like, the final climax scene, you could tell they were completely unprepared to shoot it, and they, they only had a day to do it. And, like, you just don't have things like that anymore because not everyone is high on cocaine. <laughs> so what I'm hearing is they have to steal the doors and just, like, blow cocaine in through the, uh, through the ventilation vents. That would straight up do it, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you have a, you have an interesting process there. Well, I, I actually went to school for film studies, so like, I, when I when I see a movie, I kind of just break it into all its constituent parts, and I'm you know I, I don't watch trailers anymore either. I can't watch trailers. Oh no, why not? You dissect they, them too much, or yeah, they reveal everything in the trailer. I have like I I, I stopped watching trailers about five years ago because I got tired of like not needing to see a movie to know what happens to it. Mm. and it's not it's not that like it's that they're desperate to sell it's a whole nother conversation that we shouldn't have here while we're talking about gaming yeah. <laughs> I, I did warn you before we got started like these conversations go in different directions yeah. you just never know what we're going to talk about we've so, been we've been no we've been known to veer off in, into you know pet conversations martial arts conversations uh, facial hair and grooming conversations <laughs> Well, it can get uh, weird sometimes. Before we started, I did mention that I wanted to give your your viewers something tangible. So, um, the Imperial Matchmaker Kickstarter, we're trying to do three books, one of which is a mega adventure, one of which is an adventure path. And I figured this would be a great time to talk about different sorts of large scale adventures. So, and of course, I can't find the book I'm looking for. This guy that I was talking about earlier, this is a huge book. And it's all, it's like a campaign adventure, right? When I say campaign adventure, I mean that the entire setting is predicated very specifically to tell one narrative. Now, you can tell other narratives inside of it, but by the end game, like when people are 20th level, they reach the end of this narrative. The closest I have to like parallel this would be like Ravenloft, right? Any Ravenloft game that you play up through level 20, it's expected you're going to encounter and probably think that you killed Strahd. So that would be a campaign adventure. And then Imperial Matchmaker is in the same vein as like Storm King's Thunder, where it's all one, one narrative that doesn't take all 20 levels, but it's all centered around one region. And then uh, the Trade War Adventure Path is the third book we're trying to make with the Kickstarter. And that collects uh, the adventures that already exist into one long narrative. But like you could take one of the adventures out and still run it as its own thing because it's still very modular as an adventure path. Huh. So there's a little design food for everybody. There you, there you have it. Yeah. Campaign adventures, mega adventures, <clears throat> and adventure paths. And then after that, it gets into adventures, side quests. Uh, you could probably fit uh, Adventure League encounters somewhere between adventures and side quests. So Carbo Fortress says N-World campaigns are like that. EN World campaigns? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, Zeitgeists. I'm in the middle of converting Zeitgeist. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a huge one. That's <laughs> that's like a 13-part adventure path. Most adventure paths are not that big. Most are only like six or so. I, I would probably call Zeitgeist a mega adventure path. It's good stuff, though, uh, especially if you're into, into steampunk and like traditional medieval politic kind of stuff. So uh, before we start, you, you know, you you had said you've been you started five years ago and you're now full time as a game designer. And a lot of people ask about that specifically, like how to break in, how to get in, you know, in, into the niche uh, professionally. You have any advice? Uh, well, I I didn't roll into it. I jumped in feet first because like I uh, the employer I had been working for was stealing a bunch of money from me, and I had to go like to the court and everything, like the department. Uh, what the hell was it? It wasn't Department of Justice, but one of the government departments labor. I came. Yeah, labor. Labor came to my house and they were like, hey, we think your employer is stealing money from you. And I had already confronted my employers four times about this. So I was pretty sure at that point. Um, and while I was like wondering what to do with my life, 
Uh, my wife was like, you spent all this time on D&D. Like, why don't you see if somebody wants to buy your D&D stuff? Uh, and then somebody did. And I was like, oh, oh my God, that's, that's good. So, what she actually meant was like box up all your D&D stuff and sell it. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, she meant like the uh-huh. documents I've been working on. Uh, uh, which now when I look back on, I feel very bad about because they are terribly written. But um, yeah, yeah, no. And That's and the I, best way to start anything, man. Yeah, yeah. And, and like, I, I was foolish. I was like trying to sell Paizo on my campaign setting. They had no interest in my campaign. <laughs> um, yeah, I know somebody bought an adventure and then I was like, oh, sweet. So I sold another adventure, another adventure. And then I just started doing it all the time and I haven't been able to stop. Um, to break in, uh, the f- number one thing I would tell you to do is network. Uh, go to conventions, find out where the game designers are. Uh, typically, it will be the cigarette pit. Um, <laughs> the bar, and- too. The bar. Yeah, the bar. The bar. Uh, I, I always had better luck with cigarette pit, but you know, to each their own. Pick your uh, poison. Yeah, you pick your poison. It's one or two. I mean, you're not going to find the other designers that aren't doing those things because they're busy playing a game or like sleeping or exercising or some other god awful healthy thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> networking number one. So go to conventions, meet people, talk to them. Uh, don't be afraid to email somebody, and if they don't email you back, email them back after two or three weeks. Like, we're busy people. I have an inbox. I work so hard to keep my inbox short. There's still 40 or 50 messages in it right now. That's just, like, my work queue. Not counting my actual work queue. So if somebody doesn't respond to you as fast as you like, don't be afraid to poke them again. Um, and don't take it personally. Yeah, don't take it personally. That's another problem. Don't take stuff personally. Uh, I take some stuff personally, but that's only after you've, like, negged on a contract or something. There's, like, three or four companies that I just I will never work with. Because, like, they have proven to be unreliable and undependable with me. Uh, But that said, don't take stuff personally. It just makes your life harder. Um, Don't be afraid to put out stuff for free. Obviously, I'm a big proponent of that. I'm also a believer in doing it yourself. Which is not to say that there isn't a lot of value from having a lot of people. But um, Varanthia Codex, I had a team of, like, two dozen people. And the amount of work that we did to print that book, which was about 400 pages, so it was a lot of work, was a lot. But I've winnowed down everything. So, like, now I do my own cartography and graphics and layout, and I do a lot of my own editing and stuff. And the total team for this book was, like, I don't know, seven people. Um, and there's, there's a mix there, right? Like, so on the one hand, I lose the value of many different voices. Uh, I'm okay with that because I'm very experienced and I feel confident with my work. Uh, on the other hand, it also puts a ton of fucking work on me. Like a ton of fucking work. If you think you know about a lot of work, you don't. Like there's 230,000 words in there that just didn't exist before, I think, uh, like September. And like all of them need edited. All of them need art. All of that art needs to be ordered by somebody so the illustrator knows what they're drawing. Like there's, there's a ton of work that goes into these books. So if you decide to go at a, on your own, that's great, and I hope you do well, and I'll happily give you advice, but know that you are picking the hardest road you can. Now, the, the other side of that is that's a singular fucking vision. That is exactly what I wanted the book to look like. That is the book I wanted to make. I did not have to make any compromises with anybody. I didn't have to argue with the layout guy. I didn't have to do any of that shit. I just did it the way I wanted to. And so it's kind of an auteur thing, right? Like, So if you're into Cronenberg, and Terry Gilliam, or if you have like a couple directors that you will, you know, you'll eat a baby to go see their next movie, you should consider doing auteur books. If you are happy with, you know, the Marvel's Avengers franchise, which you should be, it's a great franchise, then do it the way that most publishers do. Hire a layout artist, hire a graphic designer, hire a cartographer, hire many writers, hire an editor. <laughs> that was a mouthful. Yeah. And if you want to kickstart stuff, that's a whole different thing. That's a whole different yeah. thing. Uh, uh, friends of ours over at uh, uh, Frog God Games, Bill Webb says, if you want to make a million dollars in the RPG industry, start with two. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Frog God Games are uh, they're a weird one because they're a bunch of they're a bunch of lawyers, man. <laughs> they're a bunch of lawyers. They have their own money. They have the huge backing. They've been producing reliably good uh, third party content since the days of the three O wave. Yeah, uh, which is a long time. It was all of like almost 15, 20 years ago now. At this point. They're they're ra- they're wrapping up they're wrapping a thuck uh, Kickstarter right now. It's in their last like 30, 40 hours, guys. Well, if you want to check that out, you can. And if you're into huge mega dungeons, anyway, 
Uh, James Leslie, when trying to break into the field, is it better to start small with an adventure or go... Start go small. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I mean, like, so the, the reason I say start small is that, like, uh, I be... know that I, I have a, a marketable value, right? Like, if I go to Legendary Games and I'm like, I want to make a book about, like, being evil and making baby cloaks and, like, eating people, then they know that I can back that shit up. But if I'm out of nowhere, out of the blue, they don't know me, they don't have any references, then, like, it's a huge risk for them to take on a bigger project than something small. Yeah, I, I will say, like, we've put out a couple small products, and we're working to do our first Kickstarter in the next couple months. And, you know, we were kind of even, like, kicking around, well, what do we do next? And one of, the, one of my guys says, you know, what about a campaign setting? I'm like, no, we need to put out more products first. We need to build an audience of buyers that that have experienced the other, you know, what we make and put out for a while before we go full kick, go full uh, campaign setting. Yeah, and it's worth noting that I don't, I don't self-publish. I co-publish. I have publishers that license my stuff from me and then pay me money on the back end. But like, once I finish making a book, like I'm done with it. It's theirs. They sell it. They market it. They figure out when it goes on sale and all that. I don't want anything to do with that. I just want to make the book. And that's a weird relationship. Almost, I can think of maybe two or three other people I know who have deals like that. And you got to earn it. And the, the way I got my first one was I showed up with a budget. And I, I went to his hometown. Like, I traveled to Seattle. And I unfurled a timeline scroll that he did not give a shit about. And then I handed him the budget. And he was like, ooh. And he looked over the budget. He was like, we can do this. So, like, knowing how much everything's going to cost, being professional. Uh, I shouldn't say being professional because I'm extremely unprofessional. Um, knowing your shit and showing that you know your shit makes a big difference. So do your due diligence. That's, mm -hmm. I think that's what I'm hearing. Uh, Cardboard Fortress, sorry if you've met, already mentioned this, but uh, does Mist of Akuma campaign use any uh, interesting new rule systems? It does. It does. Uh, so the Mists themselves operate off of two new attributes, Dignity and Haitoku. Hitoku is neat, and you can do more stuff with it. Dignity you can kind of use to get away with some cultural crap. But Hitoku you can use to like resist going unconscious, for instance. Um, and then there is an archetype for every single class. Um, and we were smart about it. I knew that, they, that, that Watsi was going to release some kind of Wu-Gen, uh, but I was relatively certain it was not going to be a Warlock. So our Wu-Gen is a Warlock. And then uh, our Samurai is a Paladin, because I knew they were going to do a Samurai, and I was pretty damn sure it was going to be a fighter, and I was right. So um, actually, if you check out MikeMilo.com, there's a build for Afro Samurai that uses both the Watsi Samurai Fighter and the Mr. Vakuma Paladin Samurai. And he can do everything Afro Samurai does, which is great. Like, he's got the stats to jump into a pile of mooks and decapitate, like, six of them in the first round. Like, yeah. That, that just makes me think of uh, 3.5. I think it was Mongoose Publishing put out put out a book, and, it, and one of the prestige classes... I forget the name of it, but like the one ability was, it was like ultimate cleave or something. <laughs> and you could just, as long as you kept killing things, you, you could, could do just that with the core three, five feet. You could do that with just core Watsi three, five feet where you have infinite cleave essentially, as long um, as you can get that extra five for 10 feet of movement. This gave you the movement. <laughs> like it went to, it went to that. That was like that. a whole extra fucking feet tree. They just worked it into that. That, uh, yeah, yeah. So, it, you know, it was a prestige class. It was ability, and you probably had to have all those the whole feet tree before yeah. you got it. But literally, as you could go around the globe as long as you still had someone to cut. <laughs> yeah, I remember my old three five game in high school. That was what the fucking Elaith. That was what he did. And eventually, he like we he got loose in an, an enemy army camp, and it literally just became like a pile of corpses he was fighting on. And then the dark gods were like, "Whoa, did somebody just kill like a thousand people?" We like you. Yeah, yeah, that was a... Uh... So, uh, Chris asks, uh, first of all, Great Cleave, this was actually beyond Great Cleave. Supreme Cleave, that might have been the name of it. And and I think, I, I, you know, Killing Machine was in there, whether it was the name of the Prestige class or the ability. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, Chris S wants to know, though, but can he split bullets? Hmm. Uh, I mean, yeah, there's a Sword Master feat for splitting bullets. Uh, that's not specifically for samurai. You can just take the feet, and then it works the same way the monk's deflection of uh, range attack. Of course there is. You need to be able to split bullets. But can you catch them with your teeth? Uh, well, I mean, have you seen the samurai video of the modern guy who 
who uh, they shoot him. Okay, so first, this is amazing, and after this is over, everyone needs to YouTube it. But they they have a professional pitcher pitch a fastball at this guy. It starts with his sword. He Iyajitsu strikes it. Uh, Iyajitsu, and it like you can barely see him pull and strike. And then when they like show you the ball, he cuts it perfectly in half, which is just like what? And then they shoot him with an air gun pellet. And the first time he only nicks it, and he's like, no. We're doing it again. And then he cuts it straight in half with the second one. You can't even see the fucking pellet. Like, yeah. Like, I, th- there's a lot of ridiculous stuff about Samurai that's sad and, like, uh, Katana weeaboos and stuff. But, like, there's a dude who straight up cut a bullet in half. It wasn't a real bullet, though. You know there's someone out to get that. It wasn't a real bullet, though. <laughs> of course it's not going to be a real bullet. You don't want to kill a dude who can... I mean, even if he fails, like, what if he could have succeeded and it was, like, a 50-50 chance you just killed him with a real bullet? Like, come on. <laughs> the only guy that could have possibly yeah. did it. I mean, I guess they could have put him in bulletproof armor or something, but, yeah. yeah. That That's pretty crazy. I'll have to look that up. It was from uh, the Stan Lee Superhumans show. Okay. Stan Lee, never die, please. <sighs> well, he's up there. How <laughs> old is he now? Like, 300? He's he's getting up there and he's got he's been dealing with pneumonia and there's a bunch of fucking vultures trying to steal his money. It's actually, uh, yeah, there's always vultures. It's uh, it's, you know, it's the nature of the beast. I'm surprised. I mean, like his wife passed away recently, so I mean, it, it's eh, yeah. Please don't ever die, Stanley. If if we ever need to like digitize anybody, Stanley is number one on the fucking list. Yeah, I'm surprised uh, Futurama never put his head in a jar yeah that is oh are you sure they never put his head in a jar i don't think so man i don't remember ever seeing i think i would remember that <sighs> why, why is that yeah, not a i guess thing? you're right yeah yeah i think you're right yeah or you know or maybe 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 they just felt that stanley is too awesome to uh to undignify him by having him eat fish food <laughs> he's in a bunch of simpsons so it's weird that he's not in the futurama Maybe yeah. they asked him and he was just like, please no. <laughs> please. They're, they're going to get the idea to do it if you do that. Please don't. <laughs> I want to rest someday. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want my head to really end up in a jar. Mm. Futurama, what are you going to do? <laughs> so uh, so do you have any other campaign settings you want to do? You, um, yeah. Or are you, do you have any interest in doing like a superhero game? Because you kind of made you made one using like Pathfinder rules. Oh yeah. Well, originally we were gonna do it with Miss uh, Mutants and Masterminds, and then Clinton Boomer, uh, who you might recognize from the D and D PSAs. Oh yeah. Uh, he was, Hennett. Yeah. Hennett. Yeah, Hennett. yeah. Yeah. Hennett. Yeah. Hennett was like, oh, well, why don't we do this with Pathfinder? And I was like, okay, give me like two weeks to figure that out. And then I did. And then he was like, oh, I'm too busy. And I was like, fucking Clinton, are you serious? And yeah, I asked him to come on. And then, uh, but I said, you have to come on as Hennett. So it might have been the deal breaker. <laughs> oh, no, he's just super busy, man. Like, he, um, he's a dad now. He just had his second kid. Yeah. And he's got a full-time gig. He's bartending, and he does a bunch of writing on the side, too. So, like, don't feel that way about it. He, like, yeah, he's just way too busy. No, no, I, I totally get it. We get a lot of that. Uh, yeah. Uh, bartending, what a waste of his talents. Yeah, well, I mean, he's a good talker. I think that's why he's really there. He just wants to have somebody to draw on to. All I, you know, I actually, I actually love his. Um, he he takes his conversations with his wife and puts them on his Facebook, and they're <laughs> always hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> so found a good one. Uh, so he's usually good, pretty good for that. So uh, you said mute is a masterminds. What do you want to What do you want to do over there? Oh, uh, I mean, like that was originally what we were gonna do hypercore for. Uh, if if I translate hypercore, though, um, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna have to translate it into the what's old is new RPG from uh, EN World because I wrote the middle part of it. Okay. So like, I think R- Russ is kind of expecting me to, and now <laughs> I'm his employee, so like, I kind of have to. Um, but I mean, yeah, I don't know. I don't. There are there are good superhero games out there. I like to hack stuff because. Um, so, okay, if I want to get my players to play a Fallout game, I can show them the unofficial Fallout RPG and have them read all the rules for it, or I can just make rules for an RPG they already know and are comfortable with and then hand them a small packet. And I'm much more likely to get a game going with the small packet. So I hack the shit out of stuff. I got a Star Wars hack. I got a Warhammer 40K D&D 5E hack. I got a superhero hack. So 
Yeah, I'm, I'm like if you if you like a system and your group likes a system, don't force them to change it. Uh, if they're unwilling to read a new rule book, just write extra rules for the system you're already in. Uh, so Jacob Blackman or yeah, oh, Blackman. what's up, Jacob? Mike wants to steal my thunder with a uh, hyper corpse. Oh, fuck you, <laughs> fuck you, Jason. Or Jacob, Jacob, Jacob is, works for me all the time. He's a good guy. He's a good artist. If you need uh, really good art, uh, Jacob is excellent to order from because he is an RPG gamer. So, like, you can just hand him the stat block, and you don't have to do quite as much work with art direction because, like, he already knows what he's doing. Oh, nice. Uh, Email yeah. me, Jacob, nerdarchy at gmail.com. Yeah. I, oh, uh, can I reach it from here without pulling this shit off? <laughs> I think I can. Where's Varanthia? Where are you at? Uh, yeah. There's, there, there's also, uh, what, what happened to Shadowrun, Chris S. Is Chris S. one of your people? I don't think so. So Shadowrun's okay. Um, but there's a couple things in Shadowrun that break it really fast. Here is the Varanthia Codex, which Jacob did the cover with. And if you saw the original art order, you'd be like, oh my god. Because it was like a two-page thing with like a thousand figures on it. Uh, <laughs> he did a great job, by the way. A plus, nice. Jacob. Um, and then here's Hypercore. So, uh, Shadowrun. I really like Shadowrun. I play a lot of Shadowrun. Uh, Shadowrun breaks when somebody gets wired reflexes. When somebody goes on the Matrix. Uh, when you have somebody using magic and cybernetic and guns, and it just stops being fun to play. That's it. Like, the setting's great. The basic the basic system is good. Every time they release a new edition of the rules, they never fix these fundamental problems. Oh, drones. Fuck you, drone riggers. You're taking, like, four fucking turns. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's <laughs> in practice, it works great at lower levels. The higher up you get, it just it loses its cohesion. So... I know. <laughs> I, I only played... I have actually not played... Uh, Shadowrun breaks when you use the rules, says Cardboard <sighs> Fortress. Um, Pretty much, yeah. We, I, the only time I played Shadowrun, we played a Cypher System Shadowrun hack. And, you know, because we like the idea of the world, but not so much the, the rule system. And, and that's what I played was a rigor. Oh, um, yeah, and let's roll 40 dice... So that we can spend half of our game session counting out how many dice we rolled. Like, uh, it's so frustrating because the world is so cool. Yeah. Oh. DM Don also says Shadowrun breaks when you open it. <laughs> Let's be fair, okay? Let's not just like it's not it's not like riffs, right? Yeah, like, yeah that's my go-to when I want to dump on a system. <laughs> yeah, dude, riffs is a joke. I um, then yeah, and it's another one that's got like really cool worlds and and uh, and uh, lore and history, but system. Uh, that's how I found you as a mastermind. Someone wanted to play Heroes Unlimited, and I started looking <laughs> at this, and I'm like, "This is this." Is, sorry, sorry, please. Here's, here's like, the Hero, Heroes Unlimited book. No joke. It's like this. It's like two of these. And it's I was just weird. like, it's fucking "Well, and I, yeah." I was just looking through it. And I'm like, "This is." I don't, this is trash. Like everything, there's no balance. There's no anything. And I, I was ready to, I was ready to try and convince the group to play Marvel phase rip. Oh, okay. And then when I started poking around the internet and it was like champions or mutants and masterminds, I was like, ah, mutants and masterminds a D 20. We all kind of know that already. And I went in that direction and you know, I love mutants and masterminds and it only got better with each edition they did. Like each edition they did, the further they got away from D and D, the better the game got. Uh, and, I don't know. I don't know, man. I played a lot of first ed mutants and masterminds. I need to give the third third rule book a real good read through. But the changes they made for second edition, it just felt like they were, like, okay. So in first edition mutants and masterminds, the only real limiter on power and like how powerful you can get is a very basic one that doesn't work, and otherwise it says the GM has fiat, um, and they've been trying to move that GM fiat away, which makes sense. Right from a design standpoint, you want the game to be as applicable and used the same way by Group A as Group Z, right? But um, there's the obfuscation doesn't do for me. So like I don't know. I'm a big proponent of first edition Mutes and Masterminds. If anybody here played on Crucible City, I was all over fucking Crucible City. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I've had a hard time digging in on the newer editions. The uh, I say I started with second. I, I never really played the first. Okay, well then, yeah, third is probably a, a proper improvement over second. Phase. Third, yeah, third is almost kind of like a, a little bit of a love letter to Phase Rip. 
Like you could definitely see the influences. Uh, it moved even further away from the D and D isms. You know, they changed all the stats to make them more like a supers game, and uh, yeah, it, it worked. It worked better, and it, they streamlined some things. Yeah, I, I have a um, one of the cool things about my job is that occasionally publishers will just send me books. Yeah. So like last summer I was visiting a friend in New York and then I came home and there was just like a box I didn't know about and I opened it and I was like, oh my God, there's like $200 of RPG books in here because Taylor, Taylor Publishing, which is a great bookmaker, uh, wanted me to see what they have and what they do. And they sent me, uh, among uh, many things, Meet and Masterminds. Once I'm done reading Starfinder, I will yeah. get to do the third edition Meet and Masterminds. So, so Jacob says, Mike, third edition is the best of all. Oh my God, Jacob, we're not doing that here. <laughs> you guys have already had that conversation i take we it. have we have had that conversation i have to concur although i haven't really looked at the first edition much i just went with the second and moved on from there i liked it i i enjoyed the system for it for a supers game it did everything i wanted it to do oh yeah any edition of use the masterminds will do everything you wanted to do for a supers game no doubt i just feel like first was um arguably the most rules light uh, I feel like I feel pretty good saying that. And um, as long as you have somebody sensible at the helm, like just use first edition meets masterminds, man. That's what I'm telling you. Well, yeah, that that is always like a <laughs> edition where it throws throws trident <laughs> carbon <laughs> fortress. That is like the big thing about mutants, mutants and masterminds. Like if you have an a hole player, it's it's kind of easy. It's easy to break. Like you definitely yeah, have uh... to have an agreement of what is acceptable and what isn't. My uh, Green Arrow Batman knockoff uh, routinely shot like five arrows around that did the same damage as a nuclear strike. <laughs> so like, you need the GM fiat, but like actually building the character that you want is super, super, super easy and crisp. Yeah, it, you know, it's really, it's really uh, rewarding and fulfilling to be to be able to build a speedster that can run around the world, mm -hmm. and it doesn't really break the game. Yeah, uh, I like aberrant, but like. <laughs> I saw they're, they're rebooting Aberrant. I'm glad Steve Kenson is there because they totally needed somebody with their head out of their ass and Steve <laughs> will be able to fix that. But like uh, Aberrant is... <laughs> I remember the first game of Aberrant we played. One was like, I'm going to be like the Wolverine guy. And I was like, cool. And somebody else is like this. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to be a guy that can do like telekinetics like Gene Gray. And uh, they were all really great, but I summoned, uh, routinely summoned a blue whale-sized koi fish that just like upended ships and things like that because the aberrant is is really broken. <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll see. I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to the new aberrant, the new one. Aber uh, I think it's called Continuum. Mm -hmm. I've not uh, dabbled into that one yet. So Carbo Fortress says Session Zero is mega requirement for Supers games. Uh, I concur. It's it's very helpful for any game, but especially that uh, DM Dom wants to know and dm dom there's probably plenty of ways to contact mike in uh, uh through the description just find some of those links and track him down but they run a program called uh drinks and dragons where okay. a couple nights a week they uh they run games at uh, local pubs and they wanted to know if you can if you can send them stuff for open gaming nights and uh, yeah. you can answer that or not answer that and like i said just stalk them on the interwebs yeah, send me a uh, direct message on the Twitter. That's the easiest way. At Mike Myler 2, the number 2. Uh, I won't send you physical books because I am very, very poor, but I'll send you PDFs. Yeah. Excellent. And again, you can find those. Fi you can find that very link in the description to make it easier for you. And I also saw we had someone from Germany popping in, which is really cool. Hey, Germany. Welcome. Uh, I forget how to say hi in German. Uh, is it Guten Tag? Because someone put Guten Oh, Tag. Guten Tag. Yeah, Guten Tag. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, we are coming up on the hour. Is there anything you want to leave people with? Uh, go check out the Imperial Matchmaker Kickstarter. There is a bunch of free stuff there. Uh, it's illustrated by Claudio Posis, who is one of the guys who works on Dungeons and & Dragons and Star Wars and Lord of the Rings. And every time I email him, I'm terrified because he's so much higher up the ladder than I am. Yeah. Um, yeah, check them out. There's free stuff. It's a great deal. I'd really like it if you pledged. Uh, and otherwise, I mean, check out my website. I got lots of different stuff. You want to be really evil? I got that. You want to be in the future superheroes? I got that. You want to be in the past superheroes? I have rules in that first book for that. Um, yeah, check them out. Oh, and there's free... Oh, the blog stuff, yeah. 
Uh, I'm not doing any more Warmer 40K d d 5e. It's done. The hack is done. You can find the whole hack, Google document, in hack number 20. Uh, there's a short Star Wars hack. Uh, there's a Hyperscore Marvel series where I stat up different Marvel characters for d d 5e and Pathfinder. Although, no more d d 5e after, like, the 20th post or something like that. And, uh, yeah, there, there's a ton of free fun stuff if I'm on my website. Go there. Yeah, I, when I was over on the website, the, it scrolled forever with all kinds of... Uh cool things and we do we do some similar th- stuff in videos where we dndis different characters so when i when i when i saw that i was like oh that's cool that's kind of one of the things we do as well it's always fun as nerds to just like geek out on oh and i'm getting paid now for this too because uh yeah. yeah uh the other week uh morris from yen world was like hey i want to have some kind of like general content to put on the front page like how about mythological figures so i sent him an achilles and that went up and uh lancelot just went up the other day and the next one is uh, Miyamoto Musashi. Oh, cool. If you don't know who Musashi is, oh my fucking god! Oh, uh-huh. dude, beat down like fifteen samurais with an oar, <laughs> with an oar. Like he could have used a sword, but he didn't. He used an oar because he was that badass, and he was a real person. Ah, oh. whew, Musashi. Nothing like a little uh, insult to injury. Right, <laughs> and that was his whole thing was psyching people out. Like, ah, he's like, "Do you guys want to do this, or or do you just want to move on?" <laughs> he was very specific with this one dude about meeting at noon for a duel, and then he very specifically showed up like three hours late. Like, <laughs> yeah, Musashi. So yeah, check out En World. It's another great website, um, and has been around for a very long time. Has a really great community that is uh, heavily moderated. So if you're worried about toxic culture which is definitely a thing that we have to deal with because Interwebs. our lives weren't worth enough. Um, it is moderated and they keep a, they keep a handle on it. So don't worry about, uh, you know, trolls coming after you over there. Excellent. So I want to thank you for coming on, Mike. I really appreciate it. And thanks everyone for watching. So yeah. until next time, guys, stay nerdy.